Chapter 4, The Rulers of Terabithia Because school had started on the first Tuesday after Labor Day, it was a short week. It was a good thing, because each day was worse than the one before. Leslie continued to join the boys at recess, and every day she won. By Friday, a number of the fourth and fifth grade boys had already drifted away to play King of the Mountain on the slope between the two fields. Since there were only a handful left, they didn't even have to have heats, which took away a lot of the suspense. Running wasn't fun anymore, and it was all Leslie's fault. Jess knew now that he would never be the best runner of the fourth and fifth grades, and his only consolation was that neither would Gary Fulcher. They went through the motions of the contest on Friday, but when it was over and Leslie had won again, everyone sort of knew without saying so that it was the end of the races. At least it was Friday, and Miss Edmonds was back. The fifth grade had music right after recess. Jess had passed Miss Edmonds in the hall earlier in the day, and she'd stopped him and made a fuss over him. Did you keep drawing this summer? Can I see your pictures, or are they private? Jess had shoved his hair off his red forehead and said, I'll show you them. She smiled her beautiful, even-toothed smile and shook her shining black hair off of her shoulder. Great, she said. See you. He nodded and smiled back. Even his toes had felt warm and tingly. And now as he sat on the room in the on the rug in the teacher's room, the same warm feeling swept through him at the sound of her voice. Even her ordinary speaking voice bubbled up from inside her, rich and melodic. Miss Edmonds fiddled a minute with her guitar, talking as she tightened the strings to the jingling of her bracelets and the strumming of chords. He was in her jeans as usual, and she sat there cross-legged in front of them, as though that was the way every teacher always did. She asked a few of the kids how they were and how their summer had been. They kind of mumbled back. She never spoke directly to Jess, but she gave him a look with those blue eyes of hen that made him zing like one of the strings she was strumming. She took note of Leslie and asked for an introduction, which one of the girls prissily gave, and then she smiled at Leslie, and Leslie smiled back. This was the first time Jess could remember seeing Leslie smile since she won the race on Tuesday. What do you like to sing, Leslie? Oh, anything. Miss Edmonds picked a few odd chords and then began to sing, more quietly than usual for that particular song. I see a land bright and clear, and the time's coming near, when we'll live in this land, you and me, hand in hand. People began to join in, quietly at first, to match her mood, but as the song built up at the end, their voices did as well, so that by the time they got to the final free to be you and me, the whole school could hear them. Caught in the pure delight of it, Jess turned and his eyes met Leslie's, and he smiled at her. What the heck? There wasn't any reason why he couldn't. What was he scared of, anyhow? Lord, sometimes he acted like the original yellow-bellied sapsucker. He nodded and smiled again. She smiled back. He felt there in the teacher's room that it was the beginning of a new season in his life, and he chose deliberately to make it so. He did not have to make any announcement to Leslie that he'd changed his mind about her. She already knew it. She plunked herself down beside him on the bus and squeezed over closer to make room for Maybelle on the same seat. She talked about Arlington, about the huge suburban school that she used to go to with its gorgeous music room, but not a single teacher in it as beautiful or as nice as Miss Edmonds. You had a gym? Yeah, I think all the schools did, or most of them anyway, she sighed. I really miss it. I'm pretty good at gymnastics. I guess you hate it here. Yeah. She was quiet for a minute, thinking. Jess decided about her former school, which he saw as bright and new with a gleaming gymnasium that was larger than the one at the Consolidated High School. I guess you had a lot of friends there, too. Yeah. Why'd you come here? My parents are reassessing their stru value structure. Huh? Well, they decided that they were too hooked on money and success, so they bought that old farm, and they're going to farm it, and they're going to think about what's important. Jess was staring at her with his mouth open. He knew it, and he couldn't help himself. It was the most ridiculous thing he had ever heard. But you're the one that's got to pay. Yeah. Why don't they think about you? We talked it over, she explained patiently. I wanted to come too. 
She looked past him out the window. You never know ahead of time what something's really going to be like. The bus had stopped, and Leslie took Maybelle's hand and let her off. Jess followed, still trying to figure out why two grown people and a smart girl like Leslie wanted to live a comfortable wanted to leave a comfortable life in the suburbs for a place like this. They watched the bus roar off. You can't make a go of a farm nowadays, you know, he said finally. My dad has to go to Washington for work, or we wouldn't have enough money. Money is not the problem. Sure it's the problem. I mean, she said stiffly, not for us. It took him a minute to catch on. He didn't know people for whom money was not the problem. Oh. And he tried to remember not to talk about money with her after that. But Leslie had other problems at Lark Creek that called more of a rumpus than lack of money. There was the matter of television. It all started when Miss Myers was reading out loud a composition that, Le that Leslie had written about her hobby. Everyone had to write a paper about his or her favorite hobby. Jess had written about football, which really he hated, but he had enough brains to know that if he said drawing, then everyone would laugh at him. Most of the boys swore that watching, that watching the Washington Redskins on TV was their favorite hobby. The girls were divided. Those who didn't care much about what Miss Myers thought shows watching game shows on TV, and those like Wanda K. Moore, who were still aiming for A's, shows reading good books. But Mrs. Myers didn't read anyone's paper out loud except for Leslie's. I want to read this composition out loud for two reasons. One, it's beautifully written, and two, it tells us about an unusual hobby for a girl. Miss Myers beamed her first day smile at Leslie, and Leslie stared at her desk. Being Miss Meyer's teacher's pet was pure poison at Lark Creek. Scuba Diving by Leslie Burke. Mrs. Meyer's sharp voice cut Leslie's sentences into funny little phrases. But even so, the power of Leslie's words drew Jess with her under the dark water. Suddenly, he could hardly breathe. Suppose you went under and your mask filled all up with water and you couldn't get to the top in time. He was choking and sweating. He was trying to push down his panic. This was Leslie Burke's favorite hobby. Nobody would make up scuba diving to be their favorite hobby if it wasn't so. That meant that Leslie did it a lot. That she wasn't scared of going deep, deep down into a world of no air and little light. Lord, he was such a coward. How could he be all in a tremble just listening to Miss Myers read about it? He was worse a baby than Joy Sand. His dad expected him to be a man, and here he was letting some girl who wasn't even 10 yet scare the liver out of him just by telling what it was like to sightsee underwater. Dumb, dumb, dumb. I'm sure, Miss Myers was saying, that all of you were just as impressed as I was with Leslie's exciting essay. Impressed? Lord, he nearly drowned. And in the classroom, there was a shuffling of feet and papers. Now, I want to give you a homework assignment. Ah, that I'm sure you'll enjoy, mumblings of unbelief. Tonight on Channel 7 at 8 p.m., there is going to be a special about a famous underwater explorer, Jacques Cousteau. I want everyone to watch it and then write one page telling what you learned. A whole page? Yes. Does spelling count? Doesn't spelling always count, Gary? Both sides of the paper? One side will be enough, Wanda Kay, but I will give extra credit to those who do extra work. Wanda Kay smiled primly. You could already see ten pages taking shape in her pointy head. Mrs. Myers? Yes, Leslie. Lord, Mrs. Myers was liable to crack her face if she kept smiling like that. What if you can't watch the program? You inform your parents that it's a homework assignment, and I'm sure they will not object. What if... Leslie's voice faltered, and then she shook her head and cleared her throat so the words came out stronger. What if you don't have a television set? Lord, Leslie, don't say that. You can always watch on mine. But it was too late to save her. The hissing sounds of disbelief were already building like the rumbling into a rumbling of contempt. Mrs. Myers blinked her eyes and said, well, well. You could tell that she was trying to figure out how to save Leslie, too. Well, in that case, one could write a one-page composition on something else. Couldn't one, Leslie? 
and she tried to smile across the classroom upheaval to Leslie, but it was no use. Class! 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 Her Leslie smile shifted suddenly and ominously into a scowl that silenced the room. She handed out dittoed sheets of arithmetic problems. Jess stole a look at Leslie. Her face, bent low over the math sheet, was red and fierce. At recess time, when he was playing King of the Mountain, he could see that Leslie was surrounded by a group of girls led by Juan Decay. He couldn't hear what they were saying, but he could tell by the way Leslie was throwing her head back that the others were making fun of her. Greg Williams grabbed him then, and while they wrestled, Leslie disappeared. It was none of his business, really, but he threw Greg down the hill as hard as he could and yelled to nobody in particular, Gotta go! He stationed himself across from the girls' room. Leslie came out in a few minutes. He could tell that she'd been crying. Hey, Leslie, he called softly. Go away! She turned abruptly and headed the other way in a fast walk. With an eye on the office door, he ran after her. Nobody was supposed to be in the halls during recess. Leslie, what's the matter? You know perfectly well what's the matter, Jess Aarons. Yeah, he rubbed his hair. If you'd just keep your mouth shut, you can always watch at my... But she wheeled around again and was zooming down the hall. And before he could finish the sentence and catch up with her, he was swinging the door to the girls' room right at his nose. Just slumped out of the building. He couldn't risk Mr. Turner catching him hanging around the girls' room as though he were some kind of pervert or something. After school, Leslie got on the bus before he did and went straight to the corner of the long back seat right next to the, where the seventh grader sat. He jerked his head at her to warn her to come further up front, but she wouldn't even look at him. He could see the seventh graders headed for the bus, the huge, bossy girls and the mean, skinny, narrow-eyed boys. They'd kill her for sitting in their territory. He jumped up, and he ran to the back, and he grabbed Leslie by the arm and said, You gotta come up to your regular seat, Leslie. And even as he spoke, he could feel the bigger kids pushing up behind him, down the narrow aisle. Indeed, Janice Avery, who among all of the seventh graders was the one person who devoted her entire life to scaring the wits out of anyone who was smaller than she, was right behind him. Move, kid, she said. And he planted his body as firmly as he could, although his heart was knocking on his Adam's apple. Come on, Leslie, he said. And then he made himself turn and give Janice Avery one of those lookovers from frizz blonde hair to gigantic sneakers. And when he finished, he swallowed, stared straight up into her scowling face and said almost steadily, don't look like there'll be room across the back here for you and Janice Avery. Somebody hooted, Weight Watchers is coming for you, Janice. Janice's eyes were hate mad, but she moved aside for Jess and Leslie to make their way past her to their regular seat. Leslie glanced back as they sat down and then leaned over. She's going to get you for that, Jess. Boy, she's mad. Jess warmed to the tone of respect in Leslie's voice, but he didn't dare look back. Heck, he said, you think I'm going to let some dumb cow like that scare me? By the time they got off the bus, he could finally send a swallow past his Adam's apple without choking. He even gave a little wave at the back seat as the bus pulled off. Leslie was grinning at him over Maybelle's head. Well, he said happily, see ya. Hey, do you think we could do something this afternoon? Me too. I want to do something too, Maybelle shrilled. Jess looked at Leslie. No was in her eyes. Not this time, Maybelle. Leslie and I got something that we got to do just by ourselves today. You can carry my books home and tell Mama I'm over at the Burks, okay? You ain't got nothing to do. You ain't even got nothing planned. Leslie came and leaned over Maybelle, putting her hands on the little girl's thin shoulder. Maybelle, would you like some new paper dolls? Maybelle slid her eyes around suspiciously. What kind? Life in colonial America? Maybelle shook her head. I want Bride or Miss America. You can pretend that these are bride paper dolls. They have lots of beautiful long dresses. What's the matter with them? Nothing. They're brand new. How come you don't want them if they're so great? When you are my age, Leslie gave a little sigh, you don't just play with paper dolls anymore. My grandmother sent me these. You know how it is. Grandmothers just forget that you're growing up. 
Maybell's one lemon grandmother.